Good day everyone, I hope you're all in good health. In this video, we are going to continue our lecture on the process of interaction design. This time, we will cover the topic on evaluation. But before we start, let us take a quick review on the different activities in the interaction design process. As you may recall in our previous lessons, in interaction design, particularly in the user-centered design approach, there is an early focus on the users and task. This means we must first identify the various kinds of users or stakeholders of the systems or software products that we are creating. And then we can involve them in the design process or we can make an imaginary user with the use of personas. So, after identifying our users or stakeholders, then we begin the four basic activities of interaction design. In this diagram, you will see that we start the process of interaction design by establishing the requirements first. In this phase, we gather the functional, data, and environment requirements through several techniques such as interviews, surveys, and other methods of gathering information. And then, we also include in this activity the different methods in understanding and knowing the various ways users use or interact with a product by making scenarios, use case diagrams, and task analysis such as the hierarchical task analysis that we have discussed previously. Then, we make design alternatives. This phase is the core activity of designing. It is where designers suggest ideas for meeting the requirements. Now, if there are doubts or clarifications in this activity, then we will need to go back to gathering or clarifying the requirements. This is to answer the doubts or confirm ideas that have been seen in designing alternatives. Then, after clarifying the requirements, it goes back to designing alternatives. Now, after doing conceptual and physical design in the previous activity, we then make prototypes. So, the activity now is prototyping. This activity involves designing interactive products, and that is through the use of low fidelity, high fidelity, and rapid prototyping. Now, if there are design problems after doing prototyping, then we can go back to designing the alternatives again. And then once it's clarified, that's the time that we have to go back and do another prototype. And lastly, evaluation. In this activity, we determine the usability and acceptability of the product or design that is measured in terms of a variety of criteria. And if there are things found to be problematic or that needs correction or improvement, then it goes back to designing alternatives. And then, based on the alternatives, another prototype is then made. And then it goes back to evaluating the prototype again. Or, in worst case scenarios, it may go back to the first phase, which is gathering requirements. After gathering the requirements again, because of these changes up after evaluation, then it must go to the next phase, which is to design the alternatives based on the changes. And then prototypes are made and doing another set of evaluation based on the changes. Now, after evaluation, once the design is approved, then that is the time the final product is then produced. And since we're done discussing the first three activities, this video will now be focusing on the fourth activity, which is about evaluation. So let's begin. Now, imagine you have designed a website for teenagers to share music, gossip, and photos. Now, you have prototyped your first design and implemented the core functionality. Now, the question is, how will you know whether it would appeal to the users or to the teenagers once they use your product? How? Any answers? 
you are right. You are right if your answer is evaluation. Yes, you would need to evaluate it. So evaluation is integral or necessary to the design process. Evaluators collect information about users or potential user experiences when interacting with a prototype, a computer system, a component of a computer system, an application, or a design artifact such as a screen sketch. But why do evaluators do this? The answer is they do this in order to improve its design. Now, evaluation focuses on the usability of systems, such as how easy it is to learn, how easy it is to use. If you can remember the seven usability criterions, then those things are tested in here. It will also focus on evaluating the user's experience when interacting the system, such as how satisfying, how enjoyable, or how motivating the interaction is. But many designers still assume or believe that if they and their colleagues can use a product and find it attractive, others will too. But that is not the case at all times. The problem with this assumption is that designers may design only for themselves and will base it on their own experiences. So evaluation enables them to check that their design is appropriate or suited and acceptable for the wider user population. So since we're talking about evaluation, let's take a look at the different types and categories of evaluation. Here are the categories. The first one is controlled settings involving users. The second one is natural settings involving users. And the last one is any settings not involving users. Now these two here will involve users. User participation in evaluation tends to occur in the later stages of development when there is at least a working prototype already of the system in place. Now, in the third category, evaluating of a design or system is through analysis by the designer or an expert evaluator rather than testing with actual users. That's why it does not involve users in here. Okay, so let's discuss further these evaluation types. The first category or type is controlled settings involving users. In this category, users' activities are controlled in order to test hypotheses and measure or observe certain behaviors like tracking eye movement, mouse movements, and even mistakes in using the product. Now, the main methods are usability testing and experiments. Again, the environment settings here are controlled. This is quote and quote controlled because users are not observed in their normal or natural surroundings. Experiments or tests are performed in a laboratory and users will be told to do different tasks related to usability of the software product. So the user's activities here are basically controlled as well. Examples of places to conduct this type are laboratories and living labs. So the user participants are taken out of their normal work environment to take part in controlled tests. And again, it's often conducted in a specialist usability laboratory. A well-equipped usability lab may contain sophisticated audio or visual recording and analysis facilities. There can be two-way mirrors, instrumented computers, and the like, which cannot be replicated in the work environment. Now, the design team will then record how users use or interact with the product. For example, if we have developed a software application for banks and we are to evaluate it using this method, then we will have to invite sample users of the product, such as bank tellers and supervisors of the bank to come and participate. And they are going to evaluate the product not in the natural bank office environment, but in a controlled environment such as a usability lab. One of the advantages of this 
type of evaluation is that it is good at revealing usability problems. The participant or user operates in an interruption-free environment, so the user or users can only focus on evaluating the usability of the product. Again, it evaluates if the product is easy to learn, is it effective to use, is it enjoyable from the user's perspective, and there are different methods and machines used to measure and capture this in a usability lab. The actions and behaviors of users will then reveal and answer the usability problems. However, there is a disadvantage in this type of evaluation, and that is it is poor at capturing context of use. So since the evaluation is done in a controlled environment, the common stresses of dealing with customers in a bank environment is not present if we are to consider again the bank system earlier. Therefore, the way that a product is used may not be the same as when using it in a real world. However, there are some situations where laboratory observation is the only option. For example, if the system is to be located in a dangerous or remote location, such as a space station outside of planet Earth, then this type of evaluation is much suited. By the way, if you are curious at how usability labs look like, I have placed in the description below and also on e-learning some video links about usability and UX labs. Just check them out after watching this video. The next category is natural settings involving users. In natural settings involving users, there is little or no control of users' activities in order to determine how the product would be used in the real world. The main method used for this category is field studies. In field studies, evaluation takes the designer or evaluator out into the user's work or natural environment in order to observe the system or product in action. Example environments are online communities and public places. So, if we are evaluating a banking system for Bank Muscat, then we as designers and evaluators will have to go to a bank mascot office, install CCTV cameras, and record user screens to capture or know how the user interacts with the product or with the system. We will observe and record how the bank tellers or supervisors and other possible users of the system use the software while they are inside the bank and dealing with clients and many other different interruptions. An advantage of this is that it is good at demonstrating how people use technologies in their intended setting, in their actual use. The very open nature of the situation means that you will observe interactions between systems and between individuals that would have been missed in a laboratory study. However, it has disadvantages. So its disadvantage is that it is expensive and difficult to conduct. Now, it is expensive because of the costs of establishing recording equipment in the field and difficult to conduct because there are high levels of background noise, greater levels of movement, and constant interruptions such as phone calls that will make field observation difficult. And lastly, the third category is about any settings that do not involve users. Consultants and researchers critique to predict, analyze, and model aspects of the interface in order to identify the most obvious usability problems. So, evaluating of a design or system is through analysis by the designer or an expert evaluator rather than testing with actual users. Its pros or advantages are it is cheap, and quick to perform. They are relatively cheap since they do not require user involvement and quick to perform because no need for setting up elaborate controlled laboratories or doing time-consuming field studies. Now its disadvantages or cons is that it can miss unpredictable usability problems and subtle aspects of the user experience. 
So no matter how useful these techniques are for filtering and refining the design, they are not a replacement for actual usability testing with the people for whom the system is intended, which are the users. Moreover, evaluators do not assess actual use of the system, only whether or not a system upholds accepted usability principles. There are a few approaches to this evaluation category, and some of these are cognitive walkthrough, heuristic evaluation, the use of models, and the use of previous work. In the next video, we will discuss in detail one of the approaches to this category, and that is heuristic evaluation using the 10 usability heuristics by Jacob Nielsen. And that ends the first part of our discussion on the different activities or categories of conducting evaluation of systems, software products, or any products in general. Thank you so much for watching and see you in the next video. Good day and have a safe and productive stay at home.